So my name is Jim. I'm coming from Stockholm, and uh, I represent a company called Logical Clocks, and we build an open source platform called Hops or Hopsworks. And uh, let's go get going. So you may or may not have heard of Hopsworks. I'm just curious. Show of hands. How many have heard of Hops? A few. Okay. So uh, we're European, firstly, and uh, we started out life as a, a next generation. Uh, distribution of Hadoop. So we actually made Hadoop, and in particular HDFS, 16 times faster. We did that work with Spotify, and we won some prizes for it. And because we were so good at Hadoop, and we built up a team, we added GPUs to Hadoop before anybody else did. And we've worked on the file system since then. We've added support for small files in the metadata layer using NVMe disks. And at the end of last year, we released the world's first feature store. Uh, for machine learning. It's a data warehouse for machine learning features. So we've done lots of new cool things. We come from a research background, uh, but we're a company now, a VC-backed company. And I guess the big thing here is that, you know, we're, we're not in the cloud. This is Hadoop. This is primarily on-premise. But I'm going to talk today a bit about the next part of our journey. Um, it's actually a world first. It's the first hierarchical file system that is multi-data center uh, HA. So that means you can run a POSIX-like file system in the cloud across availability zones, and you don't necessarily need to uh, make compromises in terms of using an object store. But um, it's going to be a bit of a journey to get there. Now, firstly, I'll just tell you a bit about the platform. We, we don't actually sell Hops as a platform. Hops was our Hadoop distribution. Our marketing people say, do not mention Hadoop. You are not allowed to mention Hadoop. It's not cool. So what I'll talk about are properties of, the pro of our platform that are unique, so nobody else has them in an open source platform. So the first one is that if you have sensitive data and you want to put that data into a cluster, let's say a Hadoop cluster, you cannot pre prevent people from reading it and maybe writing it to some other place in the cluster. So you can't sandbox your data, allow people to process it in place. But in our platform, you can. You can do that with something called projects. It's a new abstraction. We'll see later on that we need distributed metadata and TLS certificates to do that. Uh, the second thing is, if you want to have a platform today that's on-premise that has more GPUs than run on a single host, ours is the only platform globally to do that on. If you want to have Python uh, per project, so each project that you have, you'd like to have different versions of Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow, you can do that. Uh, the feature store, I'll talk a bit about that later. We're the only enterprise feature store out there. You can write your code as Jupyter Notebooks and run them as jobs orchestrated by Airflow. So you can write full pipelines in Python if, you, if that's your language of choice, uh, which isn't mostly here. But I talk a lot to Python people, and they like that. Um, another thing that we do is free text search. You can, you can search for any file uh, in the file system, and you can have hundreds of millions of files and find them in less than a second, or directories, or tags on those files. So th this is something you're, you're probably used to at Dropbox and think it's normal, right? But try doing that in S3, right? It's not going to work. Um, and then finally, we're the only, only distributed file system to store small files in the metadata layer with NVMe disks. So that's some of our unique things that we do. And uh, you know, we know we're not that well known. We're European, so we're trying to get the message out there. Um, so I thought to, to get the message out there, I'd say, well, what can you do on your platform that's kind of cool? So we have a, a, a customer, a large automotive customer, through a partner. And what the partner is doing uh, with us is that we're trying to take lots and lots of images, do image classification on them. So you can think self-driving cars. But what kind of platform would you need to do that? Well, in our platform, you can take like a million images, insert them into the file system in, in just seconds. Uh, you can train models on all of that data, again, in minutes instead of hours by using hundreds of GPUs if you have them. You can then run a Spark job on the model that you've trained. And what you can do is you can take all of the images, the files as they currently are, and you can annotate them by attaching a JSON object to them in the file system. And that JSON object will magically appear over in Elastic. And then you can search in Elastic and say, please show me all of the images here that have more than three bicycles or two cars or something like that, and get that response in sub-second. Now, if you're an ops person, you'll say, well, I could kind of do this. I could put together a key value store and a file system and sort of Elastic and hack it all together. Um, but we've done the hard work for that. We have the eventual consistency protocols between the meta extended metadata in Elastic and in HopsFS. And what that means is if you take your million images and just remove the directory, 
All the metadata is cleaned up. It's all consistent. If you're a data scientist, the thing that's cool for you is that you can do all this in Python. You can write all this in Python, and, uh, and they like that. Um, OK, so th this sounds kind of cool, but the problem is the elephant in the room is Kubernetes. Like, we are not Kubernetes today. Uh, my answer to that is Kubernetes is just an implementation detail, so whether you're Yarn or Kubernetes doesn't really matter. But the one thing about Kubernetes that people don't talk about is that if you're going to the cloud, where is the data? Everyone assumes that data has to be basically in S3, right? But does it? And that's the, the contents of the talk primarily. Can we, is, there, is there a future beyond S3? And my, some of my issues with S3 is that what is S3? Because S3 on Amazon means if I insert a file in a directory and then list the directory, the file may not be there. But Google Cloud have actually solved that problem. Um, but Amazon haven't, but it's the same API. So what is the behavior of the S3 API? Is it whatever Amazon says? So that's one of the challenges that I think everyone is having going to the cloud. Are you going to rewrite all your applications against S3? Because lots of applications just won't work. Lots of applications assume implicitly that you can do atomic renaming of files, that you can list the directory contents of a directory and a file will be there. So. Let's have a look. Uh, we're going to start on a bit of a journey. So I am a professor also at KTH, associate professor. So I'll do a little bit of uh, uh, I'm going to try and convince you that this is a journey that we will all make uh, at some stage with uh, an analogy from databases. So let's go back in time, all the way back. Where was our data stored at the beginning? Well, it was on punch cards. And you know they had MapReduce algorithms. And it's actually true to, to, to process that data. It wasn't particularly fault tolerant, so it wasn't so cool. Um, but magnetic hard disks appeared in 1956. And the problem with the magnetic hard disks at that time was that you needed to know, when you wanted to read a file, what part of the disk was it on? What sector was it on? And in fact, the block size in your file system was tightly coupled to the sector. So you would change the block size if you're on a different sector of the disk. Now, this is, you know, this is alien to us at this point in time. We have fixed block sizes now for our file systems. Um, but when the first databases came out, what you had to do is you had to say, well, I want to read this record. And you would have to tell the database, if it's a hierarchical or network database, you have to say, go to this particular sector of the disk on this cylinder, and there you'll find the record. And this was done for efficiency. If you didn't do it this way, you just wouldn't have an efficient database. So the nice thing was that um, when SQL came out, SQL was originally the relational model introduced by COD but also the work done by Jim Gray on transactions and indexing. And when those two were put together, you now had a SQL database, which we know about today. So you would specify your queries in a relational algebra, and then the system or uh, platform by IBM showed how you could take that uh, abstract uh, language, SQL, and convert it into efficient disk accesses using indexes. So now you didn't have to go look through the disk and know about where in the disk to go uh, to find your data. The problem, of course, was that, that as data volumes grew, these databases just couldn't cope. Right? So a single service SQL database just couldn't cope. And we know what kind of happened there at that point. You know, we had this evolution where we start out with COD SQL and System R, and we still have those systems today. But no SQL was born by the need to scale. We need to scale these databases. But we had to compromise. So what we had to do is we had to basically give up notions of consistent data. We would, we would embrace eventual consistency. I insert something, I read something, it may not be exactly what I think it was. Now the application has to be rewritten to handle that. So many of you will know that in recent years there's been a new uh, class of database systems that have basically said, hang on, we can scale but still be consistent. And they're called new SQL databases. So Spanner by Google is very well known, Cockroach, uh, MemSQL I'd even put in there, and then NDB, which is an open source Again, European database, um, built by Ericsson originally, now called MySQL Cluster. It's part of the MySQL family, but it's an in-memory distributed database. I actually worked on that team, so that's part of our, of our product. So uh, that's the analogy, right? That we went from single server, we gave away notions of consistency to scale, and then we went back to consistent databases when we could solve that problem. But in file systems, where are we today? We had POSIX is the father of APIs, and and semantics for file systems. You have this POSIX standard. You know, you insert a file into a directory, you list, it should be there. And we've managed to scale distributed file systems to single data centers quite well. 
So you have NFS, HDFS is POSIX-like, you know, missing a little bit of POSIX, but mostly it's there. Um, but S3 was developed, and S3-like object stores were developed basically to help us scale our file systems to multiple data centers, but we gave up the notion of consistent metadata. We said, well, we're good enough with eventually consistent metadata. Now, you probably know what's going to happen now. I'm basically going to say, well, hang on, we're going to, can we go back to POSIX-like or POSIX file systems um, and still scale across data centers? And the answer is yes. Um, our file system, HopsFS, is a hierarchical file system, so it's a POSIX-like file system with the HDFS API. Google, Compute, Google Cloud Store is going that way. They're adding bits because they're building on Spanner. So they're using a, this consistent metadata-layered Spanner to build uh, out their file system, and we're using NDB as that consistent metadata layer. OK, so why is strongly consistent metadata for file systems important? Well, I mentioned already you insert a file, you'd like it to be there. POSIX-like semantics are important. Applications expect this behavior. And if you try and port an application from an on-premise or a legacy application to the cloud to work with S3, immediately you, you, you may encounter issues. And then you end up either rewriting your application or looking to use some file system that, that like NFS or something like that, that, that Amazon has, I think, one. Um, called, what's it called? Amazon file system, I can't remember the name of it. Um, the other issue is atomic rename, which is, it seems like a very small thing. It's supported in HDFS, but not in S3, but it means all of the SQL databases, you know, the, the snowflake had to be rewritten entirely to work with S3, but the hives and the uh, impalas of this world, and Spark SQL for that uh, matter, didn't work on S3 easily. So they had to do a lot of work to make them rewrite them to work with S3. And even then, they don't work as, as well. And then finally, um, when you have strongly consistent metadata, there's something really cool you can do that you may not be aware of, which is you can get a consistent change log from the database of what's happening in your file system metadata. So that means you can, you can stream that with some work to a, a system like Elastic, and then you can actually search for, through your entire file system. And you can do that in a consistent manner. And the other thing that we're doing for machine learning is that you can basically also capture all of the file system events. So if I write a .pb file to a model's data set, I kind of know it's, it's a protocol buffers file. It's a TensorFlow model, a trained TensorFlow model. So I can actually tag that and say, that's a TensorFlow model. And I can say, OK, it was run by this application. And this application read this particular file. Oh, that's. That's a, a TF records file. OK, well, then, then I can see now that, that this model was trained by these TF records, and so on. So the file system helps you do that implicitly, without you having to explicitly rewrite higher level frameworks to work with data provenance. And that's what's happening in machine learning. We have TFX by Google. We have MLflow by Databricks. They're rewriting the higher levels to, to, to put in the data provenance, but we're doing it implicitly. OK, a little bit about the file system. Um, it's going to be a little, I'm not going to get too technical, but just that you know what HopsFS is. It's our underlying file system. We basically have data nodes that store the, the file data, the block data. Um, we have na name nodes, and we have a leader elected amongst them. There's a leader election algorithm in there. And then we have this in-memory database backend for the metadata. And we also can store small files in NVMe disks there. That's kind of the architecture, and it's horizontally scaled by all layers. And that's fine. But what we need to do is make the top two layers data center HA. That's what we've been working on. And going from working on a single data center to working on multiple data centers uh, introduce a few problems. So the obvious things are that there's going to be higher latency between the data centers. Um, and then you have issues related to you know, network throughput, bandwidth, and things like that. So we had to redo everything at the whole stack from the database level all the way up to the name nodes. And this is a basic way it looks when you're finished. It kind of say, well, we, we can have a, this arbitrator node in zone one. It's kind of like Zookeeper. You know, make sure that if there's a split brain, which, which side will win. And then if one of these data centers goes down, zone two or zone three, the file system is still available. And that's great. Um, we did a lot of work on uh, mitigating for the fact that file system operations may originate in this zone and go to this zone. So I might write, read a file across here. And we did some optimizations to get a 36% performance improvement. So we introduced data locality into the database and also into the, to the name node layer. 
and that's nice. Um, but what, how a lot of people would run it is because they, you know, you want H, real HA, you just run a, a, almost a replica of the file system at each, each zone. And now you have triple replication, and even if, um, you know, uh, two zones go down, if you have enough replicas of your database, you need three replicas of your database, then the thing will still be uh, highly available. So I mentioned already that the, taking a, a consistent change log of the file system is, 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 a, is a fundamentally new and uh, enabling technology. So if you're interested, we had a paper released recently at CC Grid on it, and the overhead of introducing this was about 4% into the file system. It's not, not going to kill you. Um, but what we can do is we can take any changes in the file system metadata and push them to downstream systems. So we're already doing two of the most important ones are Elasticsearch for free text search. And the other one is Hive. So what we've done is we put the metadata for Hive into the same distributed metadata layer. So now if you go to Hive and recur say from the file system and you say remove this directory, which is a Hive database, Hive's cleaned up. The metadata's cleaned up, everything's cleaned up. We actually do most of that with foreign keys, but the, the Hive has a few tables that are kind of orphaned. So and that's why we, we take these cleaning events and just clean up Hive if that happens. But this is fully extensible, and we will extend it over time to, to add support to different uh, systems. So to summarize kind of where, where we are with the file system, <clears throat> my view is that, that like POSIX as the empire, the ancient empire is striking back, right? We're kind of saying, <clears throat> hang on, S3, it's not going to cut it. What if I have a file system that could be highly available across data centers? It can hit 1.6 million ops per second on a Hadoop workload by Spotify. Um, this was done; these experiments were done on, on Google Cloud, and you can introduce NVMe disks to store small files, and that will help with the HDFS small files problem. And all of this is done with TLS security, which is the real killer. Going from on-prem, if you go from Kerberos to TLS, that, that's going to kill you. So we do it with TLS, and um, you have a HDFS API. This is ready. You can use it now today in the cloud. Uh, but the big but is it's going to cost you, isn't it? I mean, it's going to cost a little bit more. Like the, the estimates I read is that you know, it's four times more expensive to have your data in HDFS than S3. So we're doing a parallel project right now that we've started. We don't have any good results yet to put our block data into S3. So we'll have the combination of the scale-out metadata layer from HopsFS with the block data in, in S3, and then we'll have the, the cost will be comparative with S3. So that's kind of where we're going. We're not quite there yet. But why do we think Hops uh, is interesting? Because that's just the kind of enabling layer at the bottom. Uh, so our company, Logical Clocks, we sell a platform called Hopsworks. It's open source. You can go and grab it and use it. But you know, we're a vendor. We provide support and licensing and, and all those things. Uh, and what we market it as, we say it's, it's a, a data-intensive AI platform, right? which is completely buzzword compliant, um, which is totally fine. Right? You have to have a buzzword. And I hadn't seen anyone else write data-intensive AI, so you kind of get a corner of the market on that. But um, what data-intensive AI means is that you know, people think AI is about resource allocation. How do I get my GPUs and things like that? But really, it's about managing data. And how do you manage the pipelines of data from your data lake or wherever it is into training the models? And uh, that's the challenge that, that I guess the industry is facing as a whole. So um, if you have, m many of you will not have a machine learning background. And this, this slide you may not have seen before. But if you have done machine learning, I apologize, because everyone shows it. Uh, what this slide is from a Google paper by a guy called Scully and some other co-authors. It basically says that. What people think is machine learning or deep learning is taking some data, training a model, and making predictions. And if you do a course in deep learning, and, and, and there's a course called FAST, uh, it's really good, FAST AI, they give you ready-made data sets, you train them, you feel really good and go, I'm an expert now. But when you go to the real world, your data is not in a nice, clean CSV file with no missing values. It's, it's all over the place. It's in, uh, you know, it's in your Hive, your Cassandra, your object store or wherever. And uh, you need to integrate and pull that all together. You need to make sure that you can collect the data. You need to engineer it. You need to validate the data, make sure there's no missing values, impute values. You need to um, do a lot of work in terms of ma managing your data. 
And that's where the feature store comes in. So the feature store is an abstraction that we provide to data scientists. And you say, they just go to the feature store and say, hey, I want these features, give me some training data. And they can assume that the data that comes out is clean and it's usable in their models. And on the other side, the data engineers need to make sure that the features that are in the feature store do fulfill those requirements. So we provide tooling for, there was a talk last night at the, if anyone went to the after, afters, um, about how Amazon have a framework for doing this called, uh, that we actually use. And we're also supporting TFX, which has support for some of that. But the feature store is the, we're the only vendor who provide this. On the other side, once you have your training data, data scientists want to use lots of GPUs to train the models, distributed training. They want to check lots of hyperparameters, um, again, using lots of GPUs. They want to write pipelines to run this stuff, and they need to serve their models. So we provide APIs, not just uh, general REST, but Python APIs and even Scala APIs to do some of these things. So most of the Scala stuff is on the left, and we have Python on the left as well, or Java. And then on the right, mostly it's Python is one way of looking at it. So the platform hops works, if you're to, to kind of just uh, break it down, it, it's a platform, it's not a product. So, you know, Hadoop vendors release products, which are 22 services. Um, ours is a REST API, so it's a platform with a single REST API. And you can do scalable deep learning and pipelines on it. And to do that, if you want to do it on more than one machine, um, you'll need to support some form of data parallel processing. So we support both batch and streaming, and um, we support distributed machine learning and also serving of models. So in the one platform, you can do all these things. And that's really the whole kind of cycle of uh, machine learning pipelines. So m most of you will be familiar with ETL pipelines, which is kind of the classic data engineering concept, but machine learning pipelines are pretty similar. Um, we'll see one later on. So the other thing that we introduced that's novel is the feature store as a kind of an intermediate step between the data engineering on the left-hand side and then the training of models done by data scientists on the right-hand side. And then we have our file system supporting all of this underneath it. We actually do support Kubernetes for model serving as well um, because that's become the de facto standard. And then if you're training models, it's not just deep learning. You know, a lot of people still use scikit-learn and uh, other frameworks, the H2O. Um, but what data scientists really want are Jupyter Notebooks. They want to do everything in a Jupyter Notebook and never leave it. And that's kind of what we're really focusing on. And, and they want tools for visualizing their models, uh, like TensorBoard. So a couple of bigger properties of the system are that we do TLS everywhere. Um, we have this multi-tenancy property that I mentioned already. We call it secure collaboration. And then this thing, this platform, can be a data lake. So we have customers who don't have data lakes, and they put this in, and it's a data lake. And we have customers who do have data lakes, and this sits beside it. Because the existing vendors of data lakes, data lakes do not provide um, this functionality. So just to, to, to sort of the overview of the platform Hopsworks, what, what kind of things are in it? Well, we have a feature store, distributed deep learning, HopsFS, blah, blah, blah. You can see a lot of features up there on, on the board, and you know, no one's going to read these. So the one point I wanted to make here was that if you're building a platform like this, and you'll probably see 50 other platforms claiming exactly the same features as this, right? So why are we different? What, what, what is underlying this is different. Um, the, thing we do that's different is distributed consistent metadata in our file system. And in fact, that propagates all the way up to stack, right? So we get things like secure multi-tenancy from it. We get this data provenance from it. We get our nice file system from it. And the feature store, which is also in the distributed metadata layer, uh, comes from that. Many of the other things you'll find in, in other platforms, um, I guess the AI asset governance is also enabled by, by our platform as well. Um, but you know, from the, from a te as a tech product or platform, this is how we, we differ from the others. So I'm just going to go through um, an end-to-end -end pipeline in, in Hopsworks, because this is basically what people use the platform for primarily. Um, it looks like an ETL pipeline. You have a number of steps. And the, the life cycle of data in, in machine learning pipelines is basically that you ingest the data, you do feature engineering, you train your models, you validate your models, you validate the data before you train them as well, and then you serve your models. And when they're served, you then want to monitor them. And if everything's going OK, you continue, but new data will always come in. And you always need to then retrain your models to, to, to make them up to date. 
So this pipeline, um, if it's big data, uh, you will need to use a tool like Spark or, or Beam. And they're effectively the two ecosystems that are out there right now. So we do have like full support for Spark and I would say alpha support for Beam right now. We have a talk at the Beam Summit late, later this week. Um, but the thing, I guess, the, to take home from this is that um, in, the, in the deep learning community, we just finished the battle of the frameworks. You know, we had lots of more frameworks. We had MXNet and we had CNTK and Tiano and a bunch of other frameworks, uh, Chainer, they all just disappeared. We're now down to two frameworks. One is PyTorch and one is TensorFlow. And the battle that we see appearing right now as a vendor is who will control the pipeline? Because whether it's TensorFlow or PyTorch doesn't really matter, right, from a pipeline perspective. It's just going to say train, here's the data, go train. Um, so Databricks, of course, are pushing Spark and Google are pushing Beam. And we're trying to keep our, our options open on both. So um, that will be interesting in terms of seeing how the, the community develops. Because the one thing that the community has agreed on is that the pipeline is the unit of abstraction for building a, an, an AI application. Pipelines are what we do to take data and spit out models. OK, so just to get technical on, on, on the challenges in the pipeline, and these are some of the things that the different communities are working on, that if you're taking in large amounts of data and you're doing feature engineering on it, you need to do it with data parallel processing. And typically, that's done with CPUs. It's not done with GPUs. right? And when you're training models, you use lots of GPUs, not CPUs. So the Spark community in particular are working and saying, well, how can we have this as one pipeline, an in-memory pipeline from start to finish? And they're kind of, there's a project called Hydrogen, and they're looking at it. But the, really, it's difficult. Right? It's extremely difficult to take. Because the, the, you can see it as kind of like a funnel. You start with a large volume of data. And typically, it will reduce. But sometimes, it may actually get bigger. You have some, we, had, we had a, a data set of 10 terabytes of transaction data. And we were doing um, deep learning to predict fraud. Um, or money laundering, and it turned into 40 terabytes, you know, because we added, we took, we took windows of lots of number of transactions, how many transactions in the last day, the last week, the last month, you know, network embeddings, lots of things, you know, a lot of information that you can extract from that raw data. So you, you have large volumes of data on the left, which is typically Spark, and then we have lots of GPUs, TensorFlow or PyTorch. So how do you make a big pipeline out of this? So the one thing that we're, we're actually arguing for now is that you need distributed storage. You need to have a layer here and break up this pipeline. There's no point in trying to do the whole thing. So Spark haven't managed to do the whole thing yet. It's doubtful anything reasonable will come out in the near future. Um, but this is the model we're, we're predicating upon. And in fact, that distributed storage layer, we're calling it the feature store. Right? So this is the place where you will have pipelines that publish features. So they'll run every day, every hour. The feature data will be updated. Sometimes you won't want to have the feature data cached in the feature store. You just want the, how do I compute the feature in there? But this needs to be horizontally scalable, the feature store. And then the users or data scientists who want to train models, they'll just write training pipelines. They'll say, OK, I, haven't, I want to take these features, generate some training data, train the model. I'll do some experimentation, find good hyperparameters. Now I'm happy with that. Now I can have a, a, a distributed training notebook. And then I can have another notebook to validate the model and serve it. So those three then stages become three different notebooks that you can turn into an Airflow job. And uh, now it's productionized. So I've mentioned the feature store a few, th few times. So I'll just tell you some of the properties of it, because you may not have heard of them before. It's, it's a data warehouse for features. So features are not the same as columns in data warehouses. So an example of a feature might be, let's say I have a new app that's released. And I want to check the adoption of the app. And I want to build a model to predict um, the adoption of the app. So I might look at when the user installed the app. That's in my data warehouse. I might look when the user first used the app. That's in the data warehouse or registered. But the time between them is not in the, in the data warehouse. So I have to compute that. That's a feature. right? You could compute it live, or you could store that value in the feature store. It's up to you. Um, that's a really simple feature. A complex feature would be if I have lots of transactions and I want to take a snapshot of the network around a given customer who had made lots of transactions with their neighbors in the last 24 hours, and I compute a network embedding for it. That's a complicated feature. But 
We work with customers who have up to 400, 500 features in the feature store. Uber has said they have 20,000 features in their feature store. And why it's different to a data warehouse, apart from the fact you can have reusable features, which is great, um, but we're using Hoodie to make sure you can do incremental updates to the feature store. In Hive, because we're underneath this, it's actually Apache Hive, but instead of having to drop a table and recreate the table when you update data, you can do incremental updates with, with Hoodie. Uh, Iceberg also supports it, and uh, Databricks Delta also support that functionality. You want to do data validation before the data is published into the feature store. TFX, Google's TensorFlow Extended Model, has support for this. There was a talk yesterday by Amazon. They have a framework for this. Uh, we're using the Amazon one right now. And then you want to make sure that you can look at your features, which ones are being used um, governance. So you know, which ones are widely used, which ones aren't used, when do we allow users to publish them or not. And then the final one, time travel. You'll hear this mentioned more and more in the next uh, period of time because it's a really tough one. It's a really interesting new property we need from data stores. If, for example, uh, we identify a, a case of money laundering at the end of the year, but the money laundering took place today, I want to go back in time to the 17th of June and say, OK, uh, how many transactions did this user do in the previous 24 hours before the 17th of June and, before, and in the last week before that and the last month before that? In a typical data warehouse, you'd overwrite that value. Those windows would be overwritten every, every time you run your pipeline. But now we need to actually store all of that, those, those, those updates. Uh, and that's what we're doing with, with Hoodie. And with Hoodie, you can basically then say, oh, I want to go back in time. Tell me the, the value of this feature at this particular point in time. And the reason why we need to do this is because I want to generate new training data. I got my fraud case at the end of the year. I want to see what the features were that were used and what the prediction was made at that time. Because at that time, I may have predicted no fraud. So, but I need to change the label to make it proper training data and say, actually, it was fraud. Let's retrain the model with this new uh, feature vector. So the type of applications that use the feature store, it's online apps and batch apps. So a batch app might take a pre-trained model, uh, trained model and just read it up and use it. But online apps will maybe use those models that are served over, over the network. Uh, from there, you'll typically do your training from we, we actually use Spark to, to distribute uh, training on TensorFlow and PyTorch. Now, the, the user's view of the platform is very different. If you're a developer, um, you're a data scientist, you might say, well, this is another team. They do the feature engineering. Uh, they don't even like PySpark. They want to do it in Scala. Fine. And you start from here. You basically say, well, I want to generate some training data. And this is where the feature store comes into its own. Because someone might like PyTorch. Someone might like TensorFlow. And someone may say, well, I want scalable. And there's different file formats for those. So you have TF records for TensorFlow, NumPy for PyTorch, and um, Uber released the framework called Petastorm for really scale. It's basically Parquet with metadata. And then finally, you'll have a notebook to validate your model. And you write some more uh, Python code and Airflow to orchestrate that into a pipeline. So they actually don't see anything underneath this. And at this point, I'll just kind of make our, our, my view on hops in the cloud which is kind of the title of the talk. Um, if I'm a Python developer, do I really care if this thing is running on Yarn, or do I care if it's running on Kubernetes? Uh, or do I just want this managed platform that gives me this UI and this, uh, this, this workflow? So um, that's the question we're kind of faced with uh, at some level. And at that point, I'll, I'll kind of just say, conclude the talk. You know, that's our, our, um, our platform. Uh, you can. Uh, go to hops.site, register for an account, and try it out. I didn't demo the platform, uh, but you can see it in action. There are some videos available on YouTube to show you how to get started. If you want to try it out, you can go to AD there's even images for AWS and Google Cloud and VirtualBox. Um, and you know we're an, a new project, and we'd like we need support, and you know support us in whatever way you can. Tweet about us, uh, stars in GitHub, uh, or whatever. So with that, um, thank you. Uh, if you move back to slides for the features on the time travel, the feature store. Yes. Um, I mean, one of the key problems with training data is that they need to 
well, basically the model gets evaluated at all these points in time, and the data volume of the features just explode. Um, I mean, okay, example for well, King, you know, you want to evaluate a model at every game end. And you want to evaluate a model on every game end, every time you finish a level or okay. something. Um, yeah. And then... Well, when you say evaluate a model, you mean you, 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 send, well, you send a feature it, vector to the model, gives yeah, you a prediction exactly. back. Yeah, I want to okay. have a prediction then yeah. if I'm supposed to, you know, I don't know, give the user a lollipop hammer or five yes. extra moves or, yes. you know, whatever feature in the game that yeah. I'm evaluating. Okay, There's so that's, an, that's an online model being served over here. Yeah. And then your application is making a call on But us. then the yeah. training, when I'm training Training is the model, accurate, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the problem is that then the features, you know, they might be different. That, uh, you know, if a user has 15 game ends, you know, in a day because mm. they're playing, uh, that's a lot of feature vectors. So, I mean, there's, there's yeah, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll try and handle that in a couple of parts, right? So, what you're saying is that you will generate a lot of predictions, and should I store the predictions? I guess that's one point. Can I store all of these predictions? There'll be a huge volume of data. So um, a guy called Steve Welch I met last week from Google, he worked on Borg. He said on Borg, which is the resource manager for Google, they store trillions of data points and they don't care. They store all the predictions. They just go, storage is infinite, is their assumption. Now for the rest of us, um, the feature store, so what you can do, what we do, I didn't show here, is that when we serve models on TensorFlow, we actually can store all of the logs of all the predictions in Kafka. And then you run a Spark streaming job to monitor your model that way. Okay, and your Spark streaming job could just append a table in Hive or BigQuery or whatever you want. And then that data can grow infinitely, right? So the problem, so this is the problem. This is the problem the feature store addresses because if we didn't, you can do that and that's fine, but if you use the feature store, the feature store will store all the Parquet updates as Parquet files and it'll grow. But there's an assumption that this, the growth in this will not be infinite at some level, you know, it, it'll be big, but it won't, you know, maybe double, triple, quadruple the size. Um, but you'll be able to go back in time and find out the values of the features at that point. I won't need to have the store of all the predictions, because the store of all the predictions will be orders of magnitude larger than having the updates to the feature values. No, I mean, the problem with the feature value is basically I need, for the example of the fraud prediction, I would need to, to be able to jump back in time to in between every transaction, basically, to see what it was, you know, before and after the actual transaction. No, I mean, so if you make assumption that, that your transaction windows are updated daily, okay. once a day, okay, not every minute, because you're going to have a job running here that runs every day, it'll update the windows in, in the feature store, and that update will be a Parquet file. It'll be stored there and integrated into the feature store, so the latest value will be in the feature store, but the older value will be still stored as a Parquet file. So then when you want to search back in time, it will, you'll use that, that time index to find the value in that Parquet file. I don't know if that makes it clearer. Yeah, I know, but, but I was also thinking like in terms of, say, a credit transaction company that takes yeah. the risk, like you know, Klarna, which is close to and is used here. Like, they probably want a feature ma matrix you know, for every, before every transaction for the training of if they're going to prove that. Like, I'm buying, a, I'm buying a bunch of things hmm. because I'm traveling to Germany, then I'm losing my credit card, and then someone else starts buying things, and then... Yeah, I mean, like the, kick in yeah, I mean, sorry, I mean, I think what you're talking about, if I'm, if I'm correct here, is that you, models can use a lot more information that changes a lot more frequently. So we could use all of this data to make predictions, which would cause exponential growth of the feature store. Yeah. Is that the kind of point? Yes. That's yeah. The, so at some point, you have to make a trade-off, right? And you can't use every potential feature to make predictions because the the general rule, if you have an online app and you want to make predictions with a model is that you can only use features that you can actually access um, you know, online in real time. So we, we have a real time part of the feature store, so you can make you know, millisecond lookups on feature values there, um, but you can't make it infinitely large, right? You, can't, you can only have things that will, you can insert there in reasonable time. So, I mean, you know, there's trade-offs need to be made. We can take it offline. Yep, thank you. <laughs>